This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by Jax. Jax is the user-friendly wallet that works across all your devices and handles both Bitcoin and Ether. Go to jax.io and embrace the future of cryptocurrency wallets. Hi, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And I'm Mihir Roy. And I'm Manfred Kara. Hello, Manfred. So, Hello. so Manfred is the, uh, is the founder of BitSquare, which is a project trying to create a decentralized fiat to Bitcoin exchange. Now, we have a lot of centralized exchanges and have had lot of, lots of issues with them. And this is one of the serious projects that is close to implementing the exchange functionality from fiat to Bitcoin in a decentralized fashion. So we hope you enjoy this episode. But before we start, let's have an intro from Manfred. Yeah, hello. And thanks for inviting me to your show. A pleasure to be here. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm a software developer since 15 years, more or less, and was working or uh, in a financial institution as well for a few years. So I have seen a little bit the other side as well. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> before I was musicians and musician and I get into Bitcoin more or less 2011. And since two and a half year, I'm working on BitSquare on, uh, yeah, wanted to become active in the Bitcoin space. And I thought uh, the lack of a decentralized fiat exchange where you can exchange Bitcoin to fiat was for me one of the most important missing links. And I tried to find a way how to solve this. And I was surprised that it's possible to solve it and uh, that I could go on with this. And now it's live and people are using it already. And yeah, it seems that it works. Excellent. So you have users already. Wow. Yeah. So actually, it's already live on the mainnet since January. And since April, we had our uh, official beta launch. So, and I made then a presentation tour in Europe and Israel in 11 cities all in all. And people are using it. Yeah. So we have quite a lot of trade going on and it's still bootstrapping, of course, and a lot to do and a lot of work open. But you can use it for many altcoins. We have more or less 50 altcoins. So it's not only to fiat, it's also Bitcoin to altcoin and all the major altcoins and as well as many other altcoins and are basically all fiat currencies, all countries where you are able to make a, a transfer in fiat over a bank or so you can use with, Bit, uh, with BitSquare. So we are not limited to a certain set of currencies. And we, we have seen already trades from all over the world, from Brazil, from Malaysia, Philippines, wherever. Uh, many, also for sure, more than 20 countries all in all. And um, yeah, because we have very, the concept is built in a way there that we don't have any uh, really effort to support another currency or so, because as soon as the, uh, the users can set up their uh, bank account in BitSquare, they can use it. So in, in, the, in the Bitcoin space, you know, there, there's a lot of ideology and sort of uh, idealization of you know, decentralized services and the whole system being decentralized. And of course, you know, exchanges have always been sort of the, uh, the point at which you, know, you need to be in a centralized system uh, in order to be able to exchange fiat to, uh, to, to, to any cryptocurrency. Why did you think that it was important uh, given sort of the, uh, the wealth of exchanges out there and different types of exchange services to build something that was completely decentralized? Yeah, I think we have a lot of problems with the centralized uh, systems. I mean, one of the most obvious is the security risk. And like many of the Bitcoiners remember with Mt. Gox, that was a huge uh, incident. And it's going on all the time. I mean, especially in the altcoin space, we see every few months some, uh, there are some incidents that uh, funds get stolen and uh, exchanges shut down. But I think a, a much more important uh, issue for me is the privacy. And I think uh, when we are not able to protect the user's privacy uh, with Bitcoin, when they're using Bitcoin, that uh, their Bitcoin addresses don't get connected with their real life identity. We are not only creating a huge uh, threat for the society, uh, but we are all also destroying the Bitcoin as a currency because it uh, destroys the fungibility when you cannot be sure that the Bitcoin, what you are receiving from somebody cannot be uh, confiscated someday from some exchanges who are doing such stuff, uh, then uh, people will not, uh, it will not get adoption because people will not have the security that they uh, can use Bitcoin in future. And it adds a lot of uh, uh, costs and friction to the system. And we would end up in a 
in a, yeah, in a similar way, uh, system like the Fiat, uh, where they have put way too much features into the core system, and then the core system itself is completely flawed and expensive and slow. And I think we have to really work on this to prevent that, and that's for me the main mot motivation behind BitSquare. And uh, decentralization is actually just a tool. It's not the means by itself. It's, uh, I mean, the, uh, when you're building a system where you really pro uh, protect users' privacy, you will get at some point at least uh, in conflict with some countries who are not respecting users' privacy and want to apply more and more surveillance about all um, um, stuff, what we are doing, especially the financial transaction, which are very important data, even more important like, uh, like a normal uh, exchange of information. And I think to avoid that such a project get easily shut down, you need to build it really censorship resistant. And to get censorship resistant, you need decentralization. And this censorship resistance and decentralization need to be applied to all levels, not only on the uh, conceptual level, how the exchange works, or on the technical level that we are not using servers that peer-to-peer uh, -peer network. It also needs to be applied to the organizational structure. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges because we don't have many blueprints for solving this. And that's one of the next uh, milestones what we have to implement in BitSquare as well. So this is a pretty ambitious project, I mean, just going into it and sort of conceptually imagining what a decentralized exchange could look like, and not to mention the uh, the complexities of dealing with fiat transfers uh, over you know the legacy banking system. What made you think that you could uh, solve this problem when you first went into creating BigSquare? I was not expecting that I can solve it. I was just interested to get, uh, it was like a puzzle or like a, yeah, you have to, you have here a challenge and uh, many people tried to solve it and nobody solved it really. There was a lot of a, a discussion going on at this time. And I just was kind of like challenged and tried to get so far I, I could. And there have been a few systems out in this time, or not a few, one especially, which was called uh, Nash X, which were using a, a little bit a similar system, basically were just uh, utilizing multisig to avoid the escrow function, and but it was a centralized uh, server-based system and so on. But that was a big influence that has shown, okay, on the conceptual side with the tools of Bitcoin, there might be a way to solve it. And I think uh, when you do an exchange with a random stranger on the internet, of course, you need security. And the classical way how to solve this is to find an escrow, a trusted third party uh, where both uh, traders are trusted. In this, uh, in this trusted third parties, and then he's holding the money and so on, and he's uh, yeah solving the problem. That's the traditional uh, way, but of course it introduces a lot of problems. Uh, yeah, he can steal money, he get, can get hacked, he get all the data, and the governments get all the data from them, so you lose privacy. And with Bitcoin, Satoshi has proven that it's possible to transfer money in a trustless way without this trusted third party. And I think it uh, should be also possible to do it uh, in exchange with other currencies. And yeah, and we have the tools, uh, Bitcoin, like Multisig, which enables that basically. And with a few other additional tools, uh, we could build a system which is at least safe enough. It Probably you never get a 100% secure system because the fiat system by itself has its flaws, what we cannot solve, unfortunately, like bank chargebacks. But we can deal with that in a way that we are limiting the risk, um, that the risk are at least are not higher, like when you're using normal uh, bank transfer also in the normal fiat world, when you are sending fiat to somebody else, there's also uh, risks included and you cannot escape this those completely. So. Let's walk through an example. Let's imagine that it's me and Sebastian that want to exchange Bitcoin. I, I, I have the fiat leg, so I might have euros in my bank account that I want to exchange for Bitcoin. And Sebastian has Bitcoins that he would like to exchange for euros. And we have the BitSquare, BitSquare software installed on our computers. What really goes on behind the scenes? What are the steps? we need to take to exchange? So on the conceptual side, we are using three different tools for getting the security. <clears throat> One is the multisig, also we are using two or three multisig for as the escrow part. And the other side, uh, the other part is a security deposit 
suppose a, a traders need to put up a small security deposit, which will end up in the multisig as well, and that's needed to uh, to uh, yeah to be sure that both traders are following the trade protocol. It's basically the game theoretical part that you are uh, yeah that you give in incentive to both users that they are doing their work what they should do in the trade process. And the third part is the arbitration system, a decentralized arbitration system. If anything goes wrong, if one tries to scam the other or there are technical issue or there are usability issues, then uh, a third party, which is the third key holder in the multisig, also the, the three keys are held by the two traders and this arbitrator, uh, he can step in and they are communicating and he will uh, solve the, the case at the end. Uh, and uh, try to find out what was going on. And then uh, he will, with the winning party, do the payout to the winning party. And uh, But he cannot steal money because he has only one uh, key and it's needed two keys to make the payout. Uh, and usually the arbitrator is not uh, a part of the, of the trade at all. It's just, he's just providing the key for creating the multisig, but he's not active at all. And he does not know actually about the trade. Uh, so when everything goes fine at the end, the two traders are doing the payout with their keys and that's it. So to make it more practical, so when you want to uh, you want to buy Bitcoin, you have fiat and you want to buy Bitcoin and Sebastian wants to sell his Bitcoin. Then uh, uh, either you can uh, check out uh, the offer book, because it's, um, there's a decentralized offer book in BitSquare where you can see all the buy and the sell offers. And you can pick one of, this off, uh, of those offers, or if you don't like the prices of the offers also, you can create your own offer and can publish it to the PFB network in BitSquare. So let's say you want to create your own offer. So you create your offer where you say, okay, I want to buy uh, one Bitcoin or a 0 0.5 Bitcoin for the current price, 600 euro, whatever. And this offer get then published to the peer to peer network. And in this offer is only the data included, what's needed that somebody else can take the offer. And the only identifying data, which is kind of like a connection to you, is your Onion address. So we are using a peer to peer network over Tor. And we are using this Tor hidden services where you don't have an IP address, but you have an Onion address, which is basically similar to a Bitcoin address. And you are much more private with uh, with that, like uh, with normal uh, internet connections, where your IP address is much more connected to your real life identity with the internet provider. So the other trader can co uh, contact you then when he's uh, taking your offer. He uh, contacts you with this onion address, and he does not know anything more about you. He doesn't know you, uh, your bank account data or your name or whatever. It just knows. Uh, the way how you want to uh, buy Bitcoin, maybe you say over SAPER in Europe, it's the most popular payment method, and the amount and uh, yeah, uh, all the the constraints of the trade. And then uh, Sebastian, at the moment, and you have not uh, also the Bitcoin uh, when you are creating it, uh, this offer, you have to reserve the money for the trade in your local application in your BitSquare application. In BitSquare, you has a full wallet. It's uh, it's SPV wallet, so you don't need the whole blockchain, and you are you have to uh, yeah to transfer from an external wallet first the money to your BitSquare wallet, and then this money for the trade uh, is what's needed for the trade is reserved in a wallet. When you want to buy Bitcoin, uh, you need also to put in the security deposit, which is at the moment 0 0.01 Bitcoin, which is about uh, yeah six euro. That's quite low. That might be a little bit higher in the future. We will adopt uh, on the situation. <clears throat> and that's, as I said before, uh, needed that you are later following the trade protocol. But I will go into that uh, detail uh, a little bit later. So you need to uh, reserve this small amount of money in your BitSquare wallet uh, so that when somebody is taking your, uh, your offer, that the trade can start. And Sebastian, when he wants to take your offer, uh, he need to uh, yeah to fund also his BitSquare wallet. When he's selling you uh, half a Bitcoin, then he also need to put up his security deposit and a small trading fee, which is at the moment clo yeah, close to the mining fee and, and mining fee also. Uh, so he has to uh, deposit uh, to BitSquare this 0 0.5 and then 0 0.1 whatever Bitcoin. And then uh, it's happening a 
a handshake between the two BitSquare clients. So he is contacting your Onion address, and your client is then, uh, yeah, both are creating the multisig, they're putting in their inputs it, they're exchanging also then the bank account data in that process. As soon as Sebastian has paid his trading fee, then the bank account data will be exchanged, and then the uh, multisig will be uh, published to the Bitcoin network. And a, a contract will be also created, as uh, all the trade details, uh, a JSON file will be created and the hash of that will be added to the multisig as well. So we have a kind of like a triple entry uh, system where in the blockchain, everybody can prove that uh, the trade contract has, that both users had agreed to the trade contract because otherwise you, uh, you would not uh, sign the multisig. And at that point, uh, the trade has really started. And then at this point, the money has not left your wallet. It just has been locked up in this multisig. So both in, uh, the inputs of both users has been transferred to this multisig address and it has been, uh, yeah, it's locked up. So to get out the money again, at least two people need to cooperate. And then uh, Sebastian, or no, you get the, uh, the information. Okay, Sebastian has taken your offer and you need now to wait for at least one blockchain confirmation. Uh, otherwise, Sebastian could double spend theoretically. And after one blockchain confirmation, you can start the, the fiat transfer, the euro transfer. So uh, after this 10 minutes in average, uh, you go to, you get displayed all the bank account data from Sebastian. Uh, when you use another payment method like okay, but you only have an account number, you're more private, or when you use an altcoin, you only get the altcoin address and then it's basically completely private. But of course, with banks, you need the name, you need the account number, you need yeah, those data, what you need to make the bank transfer you get from him. And uh, then you go, then, and that's the important part, uh, we are not dealing with the bank transfer in the system. You go like with local Bitcoin, you go uh, off system, you go to your banking webpage, do the transfer, and as soon as you've done the transfer, you confirm it in BitSquare, and the system is sending a message to Sebastian, and then Sebastian gets the message, okay, Mayor has uh, sent the money, and then depending on the payment method, okay, for instance, is instant or uh, perfect money, we are all supporting uh, those payment methods, which are much more modern and better in a way. Uh, so when you use a payment method, which is instant or with altcoin, it's also quite fast depending on the on the blockchain. Um, then uh, he can start to com confirm the receipt when he's online in, in a few minutes or so. With SEPA, it can take up a few days when you have bad luck. Often it's just one day or the same day, or when you use the same bank or so, it's uh, in some countries uh, instantly also, or the same day at least. And when yeah, he has to go to his banking webpage, uh, check that he has received the money from you, or there is a reference text field with the trade ID, and he also has to check that it's really coming from, from this name. He also get your banking details, so he can cross-check that, no, yeah, that Nobody tried to do some strange scams or so. That's really the money was coming from you. And then when he has received the money, he confirms us in BitSquare. And with that moment, when he confirms the, pay, uh, the payment receipt, the system is creating the payout transaction. Uh, so it's again a handshake between the two clients. And <coughs> the, uh, yeah, the payout transaction is created with both keys of both users, and then you receive the trade amount, the 0 0.5 Bitcoin, and Sebastian or both users receive the security deposit back. So the security deposit was just in place that nobody's lazy because at the end, when Sebastian has received the money, he could be lazy because he has got the money and has sent the Bitcoin. He don't need to confirm, but to avoid that people are not fair and not continuing, uh, he's interested to get back his security deposit. When he would never confirm it, then it goes to the arbitration system and he will lose his security deposit. So he has the incentive to follow the trade protocol. And in the beginning as well, have, when he will take your offer, uh, you could never go to your banking webpage and never start the trade. And then he's running out of time because every payment method has a, a maximum allowed trade period, which depends on the normal speed of the payment method, which is uh, usually one day for altcoins and for fast or for instant payment methods like OKPay. And for SEPA, unfortunately, we need to uh, 
use it quite long, eight days, because uh, when it's a long weekend, it can take up to four or five or more days with SIPO in the worst case. And after this time, uh, you can contact the arbitrate and then he will lose time. And so he has a lot of disadvantage and to avoid all these problems, uh, we use the security deposit. So when you are not following your duty that you need to make the, the fiat transfer, then you will lose your security deposit. And so that should be uh, the game theoretical part that the people are, because at the end we are, we are putting the work as the, the, unfortunately the banks are not able to provide open APIs. Some payment methods like OKP and Perfect Money are able to do this, but the big banks with their billions, they cannot implement this for whatever reason. Uh, and for that reason, we cannot automate the fiat uh, transfer. And for that, we need the human work to do this labor and to uh, be sure that the humans are uh, reliable. We are using this game theoretical element of the security deposit. Let's take a short break to talk about JAX. JAX is a cryptocurrency wallet designed by the people at Decentral. Maybe you've been thinking of buying Ether, but haven't gotten around to it because you didn't know what wallet to use, which one is easy, which one is secure, etc. Well, there's an easy way now, and that way it's JAX. JAX easily and securely stores both Bitcoin and Ether. Not only does it store those currencies, you can convert them right in the app. So the, with built-in Shapeshift integration, you can, for instance, transfer Bitcoin into the wallet and directly convert it into Ether or vice versa. And since there's only one seed, it's easy to back up and it's easy to sync. JAX has wallets for literally every platform, every device for Mac, Windows, Linux, iOS, Android, or extension wallets for Chrome and Firefox. JAX is made by the people of Decentral and they have a proven track record of awesomeness. In 2013, they created CryptoKit. That was the very first browser extension Bitcoin wallet at the time. And the way to think about JAX is that it's CryptoKit on steroids. If there was doping controls for cryptocurrency wallets, JAX would be illegal, highly illegal. Fortunately, they're not. And the great thing too about the Decentral team is just they keep putting out new features and new features for Jack and it just keeps getting better and better at, the, at a disturbing pace, I would like to add. So go to jax.io, that's J-A-X-X dot I-O to download your wallet and you'll understand what it's like to use a next generation cryptocurrency wallet. We would like to thank Jax for their support of Epicenter. So uh, let's just walk through kind of the major systems that are uh, that are needed for something like BitSquare because it seems that you are putting together a lot of different technologies to make this work. So in this scenario, when I put my offer, let's say I am offering 600 euros for one Bitcoin, I am interacting with uh, the BitSquare decentralized offer book. So you have one system to create an offer book and this system works over Tor so that's one important subsystem of your application. Uh -huh. Then once Sebastian takes up my offer and our trade starts, then you need a game theoretical design, which ensures that both Sebastian and I are going to complete our trade successfully. So this game theoretical part is implemented on the Bitcoin blockchain itself through the use of multi-signature addresses, right? And the third thing is, uh, in case of any disputes between me and Sebastian, you need another system of arbitrators to judge these disputes and uh, decide in, in the favor of the party that, that executed the protocol correctly. So the third big system then becomes the arb arbitration system. And once you stitch together all of these three systems along with a user interface and a wallet, then you get start to get the application that is BitSquare. Exactly, yeah. So on the technical level, we have basically yeah, this peer-to-peer -peer network. That's a custom peer-to-peer -peer network developed by myself. It's basically similar to the peer-to-peer -peer network used in Bitcoin, but it has nothing to, uh, it's a different technological base. Also, I'm using Java and not C++. And uh, it's a flood fill or a gossip uh, algorithm. So you are sending out your data to all your connected nodes, and then they are sending out their data again to their connected nodes. And when you receive data, what you have already stored locally, you are not continuing sending out the data because otherwise it would be endless. And that's a very robust and very censorship resistant model. That's the reason why Satoshi used that and not used the DHT, a decentralized uh, as a distributed hash table, which is also very uh, common for distributed uh, 
networks, but that has much more uh, risks with civil attacks and so on. I don't want to do, get into details and I used it before, but I never got it really working stable in the real network. And that's uh, that was basically the reason, the main reason why I used Tor to get uh, the NAT traversal uh, problem solved with firewalls and so on. And that's the biggest challenge with the peer-to-peer -peer system that you get over all this uh, network configurations and so on. And you don't want the users to be a technician to know how to configure the router so to to be use, uh, be able to use BitSquare. It should be a one-click install and uh, people don't need to know anything about this. And luckily Tor has solved this uh, probably best from all peer-to-peer -peer networks because yeah, they managed to get even over the firewalls of uh, some governments who want to uh, hide them. And that was the main motivation to use Tor. But of course, then we get all the privacy for free uh, with Tor. And that was a huge bonus as well, because with the PhD, you have a privacy issue with the IP address as well. And with Tor, with Tor hidden services, uh, you have all these benefits. And for the people who are not so familiar with Tor and just heard about the mainstream media that the criminals and drug dealers are using it, it's basically a security and privacy layer. It's a technical a solution for making your internet connections more secure, more private. And it's a fantastic system. It's much better like other systems, what we're using, what everybody's using, what they're browsing their web banking web page, HTTPS, uh, that's much less secure and much less uh, uh, censorship resistant like Tor. And I think yeah, it's a fantastic system and there are a few other alternatives out like I2P as well. But anyway, uh, back to the topic as a tour and this peer-to-peer -peer, uh, network, that's basically the backbone of and the biggest challenge at the end uh, for a peer-to-peer -peer application to, because there are basically no ready-made systems out. I tried to use one before like this DHT, but it was not really ready for such a system. So architecturally, uh, what seems very interesting to me about your choice is, um, so a lot of different projects are trying to implement decentralized exchanges or decentralized systems of different kinds. Now, one of the favored methods, at least in the Ethereum ecosystem, has been to have the order book or offer book right on the blockchain itself. Now, you, you have explicitly chosen for the offer book to be off blockchain. So this is like a big contrast with all of the other projects. Now, the second thing is, if you look at other decentralized projects, um, many of them are gravitating towards IPFS or implementing their own DHT, like uh, Open Bazaar is implementing its own distributed hash table. Now, what seems very special about BitSquare is you're rejecting both of these solutions and you are coming up and you are saying that a flood field network, just the one that Bitcoin uses, is the best to implement an order book. Um, can you explain why and what other users can this flood field network be put to? Uh, maybe I answer f first the second part. <clears throat> I was actually looking into IPFS and I think it's a very interesting project and also into BitTorrent or other <laughs> existing solutions and I wanted it. It was a big challenge for me to start with a new peer-to-peer -peer network because it's really difficult and a lot of work and it took me a few months. And it was not my goal to implement my own custom peer-to-peer -peer network. It was just a need because all the other systems were not really tailored for my needs. I mean IPFS uh, yeah, it has this archiving system where you can store data forever. That's absolutely not needed. The opposite, I don't want that uh, offers which are already taken are stored forever. They, there's no need for it. If people want to do it, they can do it offline, uh, off, um, yeah, off system. But the system don't need this at all. It's very temporary data and privacy protection is one of the main goals. And uh, with BitTorrent, for instance, it's about uh, big files and distributing the files, and so it's uh, it's also and uh, persistent storage as well. I have a lot of uh, use cases where I need to exchange data between the peers <coughs> directly without storing anything. And when I store data, I need also I need protection for the data owner. So when you are creating your offers, uh, it's uh, protected by cryptography with uh, signatures and with uh, uh, yeah, encryption and so on, that you are the only one who can remove the offer. Nobody else can manipulate or can change your offer and so on. And you, yeah, there's, and those I have not found a system which has offered all these features, what I really needed. So I built exactly a system tailored to my needs and not more. It should not, I didn't, didn't have the 
time and uh, resources to build a general purpose system for other, which might be interesting for other people as well. Maybe it's interesting for other people and I already created a sub a library where people can reuse it if they want. But uh, I just implemented what I need. When people need other features, they have to add it. And um, yeah, and the other <clears throat> reason why I don't store it in the blockchain is uh, for me, that would be a use abuse of the storage uh, capacity of the blockchain. It would be very expensive. <clears throat> and for me, the blockchain, the only reason where I need the blockchain and for only generally, uh, the, the only reason where uh, the blockchain makes sense is to have protection against double spend. Only when you have to solve the double spend uh, problem, you need the blockchain and to have a uh, censorship resistant. And uh, yeah, like for hashing data and storing important data uh, in the blockchain, or so as a hash, to prove that you had the data and so on, to prove uh, history, that uh, in, uh, important use case. And for a money system like Bitcoin or a domain name system like Namecoin, to be sure that uh, some data exists or are only transferred once and not double spent, that's another important uh, use case. But I think many people are, for instance, Ethereum, they get everything from Ethereum, the peer-to-peer -peer network and all this, and they are trying to abuse the system for stuff that's not really needed. You can do it off-chain and it's much cheaper and much more efficient. It's just the problem for most people that the solutions are not out there. So, I mean, with IPFS, we're getting closer to more systems, but it's still, I think, not, um, yeah, I think still at the moment when you try to build a peer-to-peer -peer application, probably you will not find a system which is really optimal fit to your purpose and you have, you need a lot of work to get there. And then people are looking for ready-made stuff or, or try to put it on Ethereum or whatever. But I think that's a very wrong and will not scale and will become too expensive and it's an abuse of the idea. It's not uh, my opinion, at least. Okay. Uh, in the white paper, you talk about some of the limitations of BitSquare currently, like in its current form. And I, you know, obviously, this is a project that just came out of beta and that you know, is still evolving. And as you mentioned before the show, you know, there are a lot of things that will change in the, in the coming in months and years. Can you talk about some of the major limitations of, uh, of BitSquare as it stands now and, and how you plan to address those? Yeah. From a user's perspective, and what many users, or <laughs> some are complaining about, is the trade limitation. So when you are making an offer for SEPA, for instance, it's at the moment 0 0.75 Bitcoin, the limitation for one offer. But that doesn't need, uh, mean that you cannot trade hundreds of Bitcoin the same day with different users. So you can create hundreds of offers or take hundreds of offers. There's no limitation at all. But in one offer, there's this limitation. And that's basically because in the field system, you never have 100% security against bank chargebacks. So when you do the exchange and then one day later, uh, the sender of the fiat make a bank chargeback, then the other loses Bitcoin. And usually that doesn't happen easily and often because it's not easy to make a chargeback and your bank makes a lot of problems when you try to do this uh, often. But it happens in criminal activities like with stolen bank accounts. So when somebody wouldn't this be wouldn't uh, the arbitration process take care of this? Uh... No, because the Bitcoin is already released at that moment, and then the sender of the fiat, uh, yeah, when he will give back the money, he's not obligated usually to do this. But when he don't do it, he get more troubles with the police and so on. Then they try they yeah, they ask you yeah, maybe you are connected with the with the criminal and so on. And the main protection is the amount of the trade, because when those, those criminals, especially with stolen bank accounts, they want to cash out all the money there, because with every transaction, they have the risk that it gets discovered and then the account get closed and they cannot cash out more. So, and I, that's all so uh, backed up by some real life experience from professional local Bitcoin traders who have done thousands of trades and they get scammed. One of this guy, he made 5,000 SEPA trades and he got scammed three times. And at least two times it was with very high amounts, 5,000 euros. So, so those are looking for trades where they can cash out uh, all in one. And they should not be very interested in Bitcoin, in BitSquare, where they need to make 10 trades and it takes more time for them. And they are risking more that it gets discovered and then the other uh, yeah, will not continue anymore. So that's the main, that's the main point why we are reduced, uh, why we are limiting that. And the other thing is that uh, 
with all the know your customer rules and so it's usually it does not apply to very small amounts so usually you can deal with a few hundred euros or less than two at least less than two thousand euro uh, is is out of this regulatory stuff and that's another secondary advantage at least when we keep the trade limits low we have less pressure from that side but that's not the main reason because yeah, Bitsco is designed to um, to get yeah, to avoid this pressure also in future when it becomes relevant and but it's uh, for the moment also help to that um, that we are not getting in conflict with that another uh, what are the limitations are it's not really suited for day traders and speculators so when you want to make hundreds of trades and very quickly and want to make a small arbitrage of a few cent with trading bots and so uh, bitsquare is more like local bitcoin or like shapeshift it's a little bit of manual and slow process uh, you cannot uh, and also on your bank account when you don't when you're not the professional trader when you make 100,000 euro or volume in trades, then probably the bank raises the flag, so it probably starts with 10,000 euro. It's more designed for people who really want to hold the Bitcoin, who are not mainly speculators. And for those in future, probably we will offer another system, a kind like a decentralized uh, CFD. So uh, that's basically where you're betting on price movements because the speculate, speculators are not really interested in holding fiat money or Bitcoin. They are just interested to make profit from price movements. So uh, those systems like uh, contract for difference or spread betting is much more ideal for such type of uh, people. And it's pr probably possible to implement such a system in Bits uh, Bitsquare and that's planned for, for the future, but we have too much other stuff on the roadmap first. And yeah, what's another limitation? Uh, I mean, the current arbitration system, uh, as we have uh, planned this decentralized arbitration system, and that's quite a lot of effort, and it's not implemented yet because it was not absolutely needed for using BitSquare, and I didn't want to wait another half a year to, to get it out. So we decided to launch BitSquare also with, uh, without this decentralized arbitration system. So I'm at the moment the only arbitrator. And maybe there are later a few other people who I have a natural trust relationship and I know, I, I know that they are not scamming. And that's enough for solving the disputes and solving the problems. The complexity in the decentralized arbitration system is to make it really secure when any <coughs> random stranger from the internet <coughs> uh, want to become an arbitrator, I need to be sure that he is not colluding with one of the trade and try to scam the other trader. And to make this secure, it's a little bit of a complex system. Let's talk, sorry to cut you off there, but let's talk about what an ideal arbitration system would look like then. So at, at the moment we're using, you're using human arbitrators. I, I didn't know that you were the only arbitrator, but um, in the future, you mentioned before the show that the ideal system would be a decentralized one where uh, we didn't have to rely on, on on this human aspect. How do you plan? How do you see that as a as a system to be implemented? And and what is the roadmap there? When do you think that this would be released uh, in BitSquare? Maybe I give a little bit of an overview how it works in a system. As so the arbitration system, <laughs> it's another subsystem in the application. Uh, it's basically like a customer care system. So when you have a problem. When the software de detects that there is a problem from software bugs or whatever, then you get displayed a button, open a dispute or a support ticket, or after the trade period is expired, uh, you can you get also this button displayed for opening a dispute. And then you are connecting the arbitrator also via Tor and all encrypted and so on. Uh, and then there is a chat system built in in the in, in BitSquare system. Uh, where uh, under the support section, where you basically have a chat like looks like uh, WhatsApp or something like this. If you have both sides and you see the messages, <clears throat> you even can send data. And then uh, you are communicating with the arbitrator. You never communicate with the other trader directly. And that's with uh, some reasons that because it would open up a lot of social engineering attacks and so on. So we are avoiding that the traders get direct contact. When there are problems, then there is this kind of customer care agent who helps you to solve the problem. And he then contacts, yeah, he's in contact then with both traders. The other trader gets also the message that there's a dispute open and the arbitrator contacts him and asks what was going on. And 
uh, until yet there was zero attempts of scam. It was only software problems, bugs, or uh, usability problems that people yeah, make some mistakes with the transfer or whatever. And uh, and people were very helpful. Uh, yeah, nobody tried to scam the other, so it was very easy. It was really customer care work until yet. It was not really a dispute uh, resolution. But in future, of course, when it gets bigger, someday the scammers will come and try to cheat the system, and then the arbitrator need to find out uh, who who is uh, yeah who has done the right stuff and who was the scammer. So, for instance, in when you both have done the trade, and maybe Sebastian never received the money and maybe you have been a scammer and never sent the money but you you sent the message and so on and then uh yeah the arbitrator asks them both okay you say you have sent the money he said he doesn't receive the money so there is some co conflict either the bank has a problem that's also a very probable problem but if not then uh, some of the users has done either a mistake or tried to scam the other then we will uh, request um, a cryptographic proof of your side and that can happen in two ways that can happen either that you are asking your bank for a digital sign statement that for instance in Mia's side that he has uh, started and has done the transfer to Sebastian and on Sebastian's side just a statement about uh, this time period that he has not received uh, this funds so, or so a history of the last week or whatever and this uh, signed statement from the bank, the arbitrator can then verify. But unfortunately, the bank are super slow. They're not offering this. That would be a very easy tool, what every bank could offer by default to get this statement uh, uh, cryptographically signed. And everybody could uh, work much easier with banks. But of course, they are living back in the 80s and they are still not delivering this. <laughs> so I don't count too much on this, but the people can use this if they want to use it. And another very interesting project where we don't have time to get deep into it, but um, just want to mention it quickly. An alternative for that is a TLS notary or page signer. That's a Firefox plugin, <clears throat> what you install. And with that, you get a cryptographic proof of any HTTPS web page that this page is not tempered. tempered. So you can go to your main mayor, for instance, can go to his uh, banking web page where he can see his transfer. Uh, uh, outgoing transfer. He can filter the history that only this uh, transaction is visible and then make such a cryptographic screenshot of this page. It's not a screenshot, it's not a graphic screenshot, it's a complex. Uh, Actually, we, we've, we've had Adam Gibson on the show before to, to explain TLS Notary. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he was actually one of the first contributors to BitSquare and found a very important flaw in the very first uh, concept where we wanted to build it without arbitration with a two of two multisig. And he, uh, yeah, he, it, he was he who discovered the flaw and uh, then I had to change the system. So I'm very helpful to both, uh, also Dan Smith, the other guy. And yeah, back. Um, that's a fantastic system because with that you get the cryptographic proof of any HTTPS web page without the involvement of the bank or of the provider of the web page. And the arbitrator can then verify uh, this and he cannot temper it. So when when I get the mess, uh, this proof, then I'm sure Meha has done the transaction. When he has not done the transaction, he cannot deliver this proof. And then on the other side, we see the same. So um, on the receiver side, it's a little bit more complex because of course, you, uh, when you want to prove that you have not received, you have to include a certain uh, time span or make the search filter with the transaction ID or whatever. So you can also prove then your side and then the arbitrator knows what's the, when one was the scammer, yeah, he can approve this. And when one is, uh, maybe uh, the people don't want to use it because they don't understand the system, it's too sketchy for them to have such a, a system installed. When uh, Meha is rejecting it, for instance, but you are approving this and I see, okay, you have not received the money, then Meha is losing because uh, everything what's following up cannot be 100% uh, secure, uh, uh, secure evidence. So when one is proving this, then the other has one already when the other is uh, delivering the evidence. And that's already a lot of pressure for the scammer because the scammer don't know if the other will prove it. So <clears throat> most of the scammers probably will don't even try it because they know they cannot prove it. And then the other will prove it and they are the loser already. When both are not uh, delivering this uh, or cannot deliver it, I mean, unfortunately, it only works with more or less 70% of the web pages. So it might be a technical reason why they cannot prove it as well. 
And then we go to the next level, and that would be first an uh, ID check. So we try the arbitrator uh, require real life identification with passport and or whatever they want to to give. When he say no, real life I don't want to give, but my Facebook account you have can have. And then it depends what the other uh, deliver. When he has much stronger proof, he has a much better card at the end. And the next level would be that you make a more classical way that you make a Skype chat and you, you, you force him to navigate to your banking web page and show you this. And then it it's never 100% secure because you could, when you're technically very good, you could cheat this and so on. But I mean, the summarizing of everything and the impression also for the arbitrators, for the arbitrator, it's probably good enough for the huge majority of cases to get a, a good solution. And even if it fails and the arbitrator make a wrong decision in one case, it's not the end of the world. It's um, more or less at the moment, maximum two Bitcoin. When it would be with altcoins, we have a high limit. With fiat, it's 0 0.75 Bitcoin. Actually, with fiat, there is zero risk because uh, with fiat, uh, uh, with altcoins, there is zero risk because uh, the arbitrator can go to the blockchain and see it publicly in the blockchain. So nobody can cheat. And um, yeah. That's basically how the system works from uh, the user perspective. And uh, to make yeah, to make it really secure, this uh, completely open and decentralized arbitration system uh, is planned that everybody can become an arbitrator. And they are basically also anonymous there, so there is no reputation and so on. Uh, but they have to lock up quite a high amount of Bitcoin in a multisig. So they have to lock up maybe something like five or 10 Bitcoin. And uh, it's locked up in a multisig of the arbitrators with the highest reputation. A reputation means in that sense, they, uh, those are those arbitrators who are connected with the project. Maybe me and a few team members where I know we are not scammers because when we are scamming, we are destroying our project. So the incentives alive, align that we are not trying to earn money by stealing a Bitcoin from another and destroy the whole project. <laughs> I mean, that would be completely bullshit. And uh, so we are the key holders who are the arbitrator who have locked up more money. They can maybe uh, uh, decide themselves how much money they want to lock up, but the more money, the higher their reputation is. And, uh, yeah, and when they are colluding, for instance, when an arbitrator tried to collude uh, yeah, with one of the traders and then uh, scam the other trader, then uh, the other trader can uh, request a second round. Then he will request the BitSquare team, hey, have a look, this arbitrator is a scammer, it, I have done everything correctly. And then somebody of, or, yeah, of this high reputation arbitrators will investigate the case again. And when he finds out that he was either colluding or working completely below the quality requirements, that for instance, he had accepted a, a Photoshop screenshot, which can easily be faked, which is not allowed as we have then a clear guidance for the arbitrators and also for the users, how is the procedure and what are the requirements. And uh, yeah, when we find out that this arbitrator has violated the rules, he will lose his security deposit depending on the, on the severity of his, uh, of his um, um, case. He will lose all or just a part and that get confiscated and yeah, get probably a donation for the project or whatever. But, uh, it, there are also, this project is still in the, I mean, uh, there is some more or less clear ideas, but as we have not implemented, and I get at the moment a lot of experience, uh, that experience will flow into the real project. And when we start to work on this, uh, it might change. And there are a few uh, open complexities because <clears throat> for instance, when you have locked up five Bitcoin and then you do 20, you as an arbitrator are used with 20 other trades and at nearly the same time you try to collude with all this and scam them then you can create the damage of 20 bitcoin but you have only locked up five bitcoin so to deal with all this uh, complexities that's a little bit of a challenge and there are not 100 percent clear solutions yet but um yeah we still have time we have many other stuff which is more important at the moment for the users because for the users at the moment uh the fact that it should be really decentralized is again for the censorship resistance that become only relevant when BitSquare is really big and we get political pressure, or whatever. And that's not in the case yet, luckily, and probably will not be the case in half a year. So that's maybe in two years. And until this time, we have a little bit of uh, space to also uh, yeah, use this not perfectly decentralized system 
at which secures the, uh, the system at the moment. For the users at the end, it's only important that uh, they have a secure solution. And uh, yeah, that's the case at the moment because I'm the only arbitrator and I, I think it's clear to everybody that I will not scam anybody. Today's magic word is offer, O-F-F-E-R. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener reward. Yeah, I mean, it, it seems to me that the arbitration system is actually a point of monetization for your project, right? Because the arbitrators are kind of delivering a service and in theory, you could have an organization of arbitrators that deliver this service and make a living out of it. So are you thinking of raising some project funding or creating an organization around this idea? Yeah, it was actually planned that the arbitrators <clears throat> earn money by, uh, by their disputes. So when, when they're doing a dispute and one has lost, then the security deposit will go to the arbitrator as payment for his service. But I'm moving a little bit away from this idea for various reasons. One is that it creates a little bit of a negative incentive. <clears throat> the arbitrator should be really a customer care agent who would try to satisfy both because, and I think most of the cases will not be scams. It will be uh, technical problems or usability problems. And then he don't take the, uh, the deposit because nobody want to hurt the system or so. They just make a mistake or maybe it was a mistake in the software. So he don't earn anything basically. And at the moment, the trading fee, so the, the business model is basically the trading fees. So there, at the moment, the trading fees are super low, uh, but later it will be adopted to the market situation. And uh, the trading fee are basically the revenue for the project. And at the moment, the arbitrator receives the trading fee, but it's, as I said, it's nearly nothing. Or it's by far not enough money for the effort, uh, what I have, for the time, what I'm spending. And I think it also will not align really, because when you really, some cases will take you hours even and to get a, a, a normal payment in Europe when you work a few hours it would be 100 euros so, and we never can uh, use such a high security deposit or a trading fee or whatever to to make this work so I think it does not work very well <clears throat> probably we will add the arbitrators so I don't want to maybe to change the topic too much but we plan a kind like a decentralized autonomous autonomous organization, but we don't want to call it DAO anymore because of all what happened and so on. And it's basically very <laughs> the opposite of that, what uh, the DAO was standing for. I call it a synergetic cooperation. And that means that all people who are working for the project, who are providing any value for the project will become owner of the project. And they are uh, the stakeholder and the shareholder and the arbitrator are very important roles in this project. So they become, they, they, uh, yeah, they receive shares on on the number of cases or whatever. The details are not fleshed out, but that's probably the model what I will implement in future. So this synergistic corporation, like how does the how does the corporation make money in the end? Because, I mean, if I if I get tokens, so let's say I'm an arbitrator, and I in in exchange for doing arbit arbitration, I get shares or tokens inside the synergistic corporation. Those tokens will have value only when the corporation makes money of some form. Yeah, exactly. So what would what would be the mo model there? The trading fees are get uh, paid like dividends to all the stakeholders, <clears throat> and depending on your percentage, when you have one percent of the project, you receive over time one percent of all the trading fees. So that's the revenue and the business model. And how to implement this is uh, we yeah the tokens will be represented in the uh, Bitcoin blockchain as a kind of a color coin, but different, more simple, because again, I just want to implement what I exactly need for my project and not more. It's not the general purpose solution. It's only what I need. And it works basically like this, that when you, for instance, are working for the project and you have done some whatever programming, and then maybe you tell me before you, you want 1000 euro or 5000 euro for this or later, we agree to that and then you <clears throat> will receive shares which are represented the same amount in euro and we take the late uh, the market price the average market price from the last months and then we convert it to the number of shares and then for instance you get uh, uh, yeah 100 shares for that and one share is represented as a value of for instance 1000 satoshi so i make a payment a bitcoin 
uh, transaction with 1,000 Satoshi multiplied by the number of shares. Let's say 10 shares you get, so you get 10,000 Satoshi. And I make a transaction from my origin address, which will be a multisig. So the BitSquare uh, board or the team members will sign this. And we will uh, issue money. We are printing money, basically. We are creating a new share and sending this share to you. So, uh, and then there is in the op return a second address from you, where uh, a Bitcoin address, which will be used as the dividend ad address, where you will receive the trading fees in future. So <laughs> we have basically a model where we are representing the tokens in the uh, Bitcoin blockchain, and additionally the dividend address for receiving the the, yeah, the, the trading fees, uh, and all is locked up in one transaction. And when you can also then trade the shares over BitSquare, and you can sell the shares to somebody else. So the handling of the shares will be all integrated in BitSquare, so you don't need to do anything manually, of course. And uh, when you are selling your share for, uh, from this 10,000 shares, you are selling maybe 3,000 to somebody else, <clears throat> then 7,000 go back to your own address. And then in the multisig, uh, in the in the op return, there are two addresses: one from the new owner of the 3,000 shares, and the second from the owner of the 7,000 shares. So we are representing all that in the blockchain, the Bitcoin blockchain alone. That has the advantage that we are not dependent to another altcoin or other system and so on or a company. And it's very simple to implement, basically. And the users, every node, every BitSquare uh, user are uh, requesting all the outgoing transaction from this origin address and all the follow up. So it's a tree of transaction until it finds the last unspent transaction output and that's the actual shareholder because when you have uh, sold your share the first transaction is not valid anymore so does this mean that you would have to parse the entire blockchain if you're reading from up return no uh, because we only need those uh, uh, transaction we uh, transactions which are originating from this uh, origin address right okay and that uh, so that's limited. the transactions from there yeah. Okay, right. That's maybe at the beginning hundreds or thousands, but that will not be millions of transactions. And even when it becomes that people are trading like hell and we are getting to scaling issues, then there's a lot of optimization headroom for pruning and for putting uh, snapshots into the code so you don't need to load all the old transactions which are already buried in the blockchain and so on. So okay. I think it's not that it would not probably work for a general purpose uh, color coin solution because then you need to support hundreds or thousands of different color coins and then it's probably cheaper to get the whole blockchain. But for our solution it works and it helps us to, yeah, to implement everything uh, directly in the application. So the users have then a, a view of all the shareholders. So maybe there are a thousand shareholders and uh, it sees then yeah, the amount of, the share, of every share and so it uh, gets the mapping. And then the trading fee will be dis, uh, decided by basically by random, but in a way that the other user can verify it. So it's using his onion address and the trade ID, also data what he cannot change, and then make a selection to one of the shareholders. And the higher your amount, uh, when you have 10% share, you have a probability of 10% that you are the receiver of the trading fee. And with that, we have a stream of micropayments from the users directly to the shareholders. So BitSquare is never holding the dividends or whatever. It goes directly to the shareholders. And also when somebody managed to hack your client or whatever, and then he only can steal uh, that amount from one user, from one trader. He need to hack the whole system and the software of all the traders that he really can steal more money. And even then we can make a, a new version and block this and whatever. Okay. So I think it's very secure and very avoids a lot of all, uh, avoids avoids uh, a lot of all those risks with collecting too much money so we don't have 150 millions where somebody can uh, <laughs> steal and we we try also to avoid a lot of these issues with ICOs that that people who are laymen who don't have any clue about the project get tricked into buying that with a lot of marketing and then uh, yeah and then they are upset because they found out they got scammed in a way and we are only giving out the shares to participants, to people who are working for the projects. And by definition, those are experts. Otherwise, their participation does not have value. That's a very big difference from uh, some of the other projects that we've discussed on this show in the past. Yeah. So uh, to my, before we wrap things up here, uh, let's bring it back to, to BitSquare. Um, you mentioned earlier that the project came out of beta. Can you tell us about the roadmap? Uh, and are, are there any plans to turn this into some sort of a 
like company that maintains this open source software with some sort of business model? Or do you think this is something that will remain open source um, over the long term? Yeah, so there are, as the roadmap is, my next now big task is as the next days, probably when the show is live, hopefully the new release already out with a lot of new features and probably we also root and Bitcoin J and maybe all uh, traffic over Tor because at the moment the Bitcoin J traffic is not rooted over Tor and also there are some other connections like the price feeds, which is not really privacy relevant, but we would like to get to at 100% uh, Tor coverage. <clears throat> probably we can make it to get this in the next release as well. But then the next big step is this uh, synergetic cooperation because that's needed for scale up the project. I'm currently working basically still alone, not alone. I mean, there are a few contributors and it's getting more and more luckily, but probably still 90% of the work is on my side and it does not scale up. I mean, I need more contributors and most people cannot afford it or are not motivated enough to work for such a project in a full-time way or really with more hours, like a little bit for a bounty. And so this, uh, this and that's basically the, the business model. And uh, co uh, yeah, the, instead of a corporation, we will never create a company for BitSquare itself. Maybe I create a company for myself as a software developer to have uh, better protection from, uh, from the legal system that I have to figure out. But that's just me as a person, it's not BitSquare itself. So BitSquare stays open source and will be represented by this synergetic cooperation. And everybody who, uh, yeah, who want to contribute becomes shareholder and they can sell the shares and other people who don't have the time, so as time or skills, they can buy it on the shares on the market. So it's basically then like investors and there will be the market force will decide what's the value of the share and uh, the price and the value of the project. So people, who are contributing can indirectly earn money as they are selling their shares on the market and then get the euro with, or a Bitcoin first and then. So where can people learn more about BitSquare? Where, where, where would you send people off uh, to uh, learn more or perhaps contribute to the project? Yeah, uh, just go to bitsquare.io as our main uh, webpage. There you find a lot of information like the white paper, video, for, uh, and all kind of uh, levels, uh, very high level introduction and on a lot of detail videos also about the trade process and arbitration system and all kind. And then we have a forum, which is already quite active. Uh, so when you have any question or want to contribute, uh, help to contribute, uh, pass by to the forum. We have a lot of other communication channels like ISC or on Twitter, of course, and yeah, all the usual stuff. So just pa pass by at bitsquare.io and you will find your way to get in touch with us. Okay, and we'll have links to all the and the white paper and everything in the show notes. Yeah. Well, my friend, thanks so very much for coming on. It was an interesting discussion about uh, a topic which uh, I think, I mean, we've talked a lot about decentralized systems, but a decentralized exchanges is not something that uh, we've covered very much. And so uh, good luck with the project. Yeah, thanks a lot. And it was a pleasure to be on your show. Well, thank you. And thanks to our listeners for tuning in. Uh, we release new episodes of Epicenter Bitcoin every Monday. Recently, you may have noticed that we've been releasing on Tuesday. That's because we've had a few organizational changes in the company. And uh, and uh, and oftentimes, sometimes it's just scheduling and it's hard to get them out uh, all the time on Monday. So uh, hopefully we can get better at that and we can keep get, keep getting them out on, on Mondays. But uh, if, if they're on your podcast feed on Monday, just you know wait a couple more hours and we'll have it on Tuesday usually. That's about the latest that they do come out. Uh, you can find us on on a, the LTB network. We're at letstopbitcoin.com, where you can also find other great shows about Bitcoin, blockchains, decentralized technologies, Ethereum, and all that stuff. Uh, of course, you can leave us a review on iTunes. And if you do so, you send us a sh uh, an email at show at epicenterbitcoin.com, and we will send you a free T-shirt. And also, uh, if you'd like, you can send us a tip, and the tipping address will be in the show description. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.